How is the mobile HTML5 landscape shaping up? Well, it's always complicated because we have so many devices out there and so many browsers. So, but fortunately, we are kind of getting into something with uh, new devices coming out that uh, let the web developers and web designers try to think about the design for just a couple of some kind of virtual devices. Let's say we have the iPhone 6 Plus, the iPhone 6, the iPhone 5, we have several Android devices just in the, for taking just one series, let's talk about the, the Samsung Galaxy series. We have uh, different screen sizes and different resolutions. However, uh, modern browsers, they have a way to simplify all those uh, screen sizes for web developers. So that means that we are getting better than a couple of years ago. Also, performance is getting better. Uh, although we need to remember that we are still, we are still working with cellular connections. Uh, 4G connections worldwide is less than 4% of the users. So uh, 3G is basically the, the average connection. So we need to understand that. So it's just still a challenge. It's always a challenge, but it's getting better. And speaking of browsers, how are the various platforms performing? Who's doing a good job? Well, let's say that right now, half of the users that are browsing the web through a mobile phone are using iOS. Um, when they're using iOS, iPhone, iPad, or iPod Touch, they are basically browsing through Safari. That's the only browser that I, I, an iOS user uh, has. So um, it's one of the best browsers out there in terms of features available, and also in terms of uh, how you can debug your apps or how you can uh, try to measure performance. So you have the tool for that. Then we have the Android environment, right? In the Android environment, roughly, we are talking about 40% of the users browsing the web. The problem with Android is that we have so many browsers out there uh, that are roughly uh, a third browsing with Google Chrome. A lot of web designers and web developers think that Basically, Chrome is everywhere on Android, but that's not true. Google Chrome is not the default browser on, on most Androids out there. It's not even in the open source project. Uh, besides, when we buy a phone, sometimes we have Google Chrome pre-installed because that's an agreement between the manufacturer, let's say Samsung, and Google. But it's not part of the Android open source project. Then we have Android browser, that is the default browser that we have on most Android devices. And unfortunately, today, most users are browsing with that browser. It's called Android browser or stock browser. Or it doesn't have a name, really. It says browser. And finally, we have other manufacturers, for example, Samsung or LG. They are providing another browser that some, sometimes is called as internet. So it, it has a, an icon with the name internet. And that browser is different. It's Chromium-based, so it's similar to Chrome, but it's not really Chrome. So that means that it's still like complicated from a web designer and developer's point of view to test on every kind of device, every kind of Android. Finally, the last 10% is a mix between IE, Internet Explorer, or Windows Phone, Opera, that is usually Opera Mini on feature phones, and Firefox. And that's a lot of yeah. platforms. So you've mentioned a couple of the challenges. One of them clearly is a browser problem. But what would you say are the biggest challenges other than the browser platforms for developers? And what are some ways that they can address them? Well, I think the, the biggest challenge, if, if I need to pick one, is performance. Right? Performance is the most important feature right now on the mobile web. Why? Because, again, we're using cellular connections. Cellular connections have greater latency. That means that for getting the first byte from the server, it takes time. And on 3G, it might take up to half a second just to receive the first byte. And people, people want fast websites, as fast as possible. So we have that particular challenge. There are a lot of ways to, to let's say, to try to solve the problem right, with different techniques. And one of the biggest issues that I'm seeing right now on the market is the overusage of responsive web design. That is a huge topic around mobile. And sometimes when you set responsiveness or responsive web design as your goal, you have the problem that you are like some kind of a losing focus of the real thing. The real problem is performance. So uh, maybe you have a website that looks perfect on every mobile device, 
or if you shrink the window, it, it relay out perfectly, but it's really slow on a mobile phone. So um, you should get the fastest and best possible experience for each device. And that's basically a challenge that has never changed in the last year. It's the same challenge, right? Uh, of course, new devices, um, new things are adding new challenges, but always the idea is trying to get as fast as possible the best possible experience. Do you recommend against responsive design? No, no, because I'm using responsive design all the days. In fact, responsible design is a technique that right now is like a default thing that you're not going to ask yourself, should we use responsive web design? It's like a couple of years ago, should we use background images? Or should we use an image for the logo instead of text? Well, it's a default, right? So uh, right now we, we need responsive web design because for example, we need to adjust our code to iPhone 6 plus and iPhone 6 because one is wiser than the other. So we need that, right? But the, the problem is that some people and companies are thinking of responsive web design as some kind of a solution for all the devices out there. And it's nice you have one, to have one source code that will work everywhere. I mean, it's a nice idea, but in the real world with cellular connections and, and slow devices, that might be a problem. So you can do responsive web design uh, with performance, right, in mind. The, thing, the problem is that people that are uh, spending money, uh, adding budget on responsive web design, they're not adding money for performance. So if you are doing responsive web design, you also must have a budget for performance. So if you do both, then it will work because there are mixed solutions, in, including, including some JavaScript libraries or some server-side libraries, that will help performance on responsive sites. So you can do it in the good way. But if you just think about the design point of view of responsive web design, it will look fine, but it will be slow on mobile devices. We've been talking about mobile web development. Uh, how do you see the role of mobile changing as IoT, the Internet of Things, mm -hmm. becomes ubiquitous? Well, yeah, now we have devices everywhere. Uh, besides wearables, right now I have my my smartwatch here, uh, but maybe in 10 years we're going to see uh, devices everywhere sending input information to apps. Those apps might be in a server, in the cloud, and those apps will uh, generate some kind of uh, intelligence and will bring us back information from that intelligence on other devices. It can be smartwatch, smart glass, our phone, we don't know yet exactly. Uh, what well, will will be here, but there are a lot of challenges there for content owners or let's say uh, companies because you need to understand that you are going to be everywhere. So there are still companies today that they don't think they need a mobile website. So for them, talking about IoT, IoT is like uh, a super future. But you need to understand that your service, the, the service you are providing right now, will change. So you need to embrace the change. That's the first uh, suggestion I have. Because we know that, the only know that, that we have for sure granted right now is that everything is going to change. It's the only thing that we know. So uh, we need to design for the change and don't think about devices as some kind of, uh, of a goal or the achievement. Our achievement is to create our new iOS application, our new Android application. That doesn't care really. You need to think about how you're going to serve your user through multiple devices. One instance today is the Android application or the iOS application. But in the future, it might be I know, a Ring application or wherever. So um, if you embrace the future, you embrace the change, and you start thinking about uh, possibilities, then you will be faster when the technology is here. What kind of development challenges do you foresee in IoT? Well, uh, the first problem is how to serve multi-devices because again we have devices that are input devices such as uh, uh, heart rate, heart monitor or you have for, for health and you have devices that are for output such as a, a glass or a device that you can attach to your, to your car or at home a little family robot uh, there are a couple of projects out there for that so from a developer's perspective uh, the challenge is to set your goals as a company and, and see what kind of information can you get from IoT and the information you're going to give to IoT. So like input output and what is the, 
the smart solution. So we, because here you need to add value to the data. So you're going to get raw data from uh, elements around the user and you need to add value to that data to give information finally to the user through all their all its devices, so all the devices that the user have. It can be the car, the house, the phone, the glass, the computer, wherever. So we need to think about that. It's, it's a real challenge for companies that right now they're thinking on a website. So their, their product is the website or their app. They're not opening the, the, the thing to new ideas. And to new devices. Or to new devices yeah. that are like appearing. Like cars or yeah, houses. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. We are going to see maybe next year cars uh, with devices and, and screens that will connect to our phones. The same happens with the, the smart house and, and a lot of things. Uh, beacons, when you get into a shopping mall, you will get information. You re your phone will receive information from those beacons, such as offers and that kind of things, uh, or mu museum, and you're getting information about what you're seeing. And that sort of things are going to start growing, growing up all the time. And what are the most exciting things that you're seeing in mobile right now? Like, what people and projects are you really keeping an eye on? Uh, in terms of projects, there are so many that it's, it's very difficult to find one that is really interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to follow a lot of um, projects that are working more on, on this idea of giving more value, right, to, to your, your information. Uh, so I'm traveling a lot, for example, and all the, the, the apps or solutions that are adding value to my, to my trips are really useful for me. So that that kind of things are really important from uh, companies that can read my emails or I can forward emails and they will parse my email from hotels, from airlines, and they will add some value there. So for example, now I have a couple of apps and if I have a, a, a delayed flight, I will receive a notification here on my watch directly. So those kind of uh, solutions that uh, bring me Solutions to problems that I have all the, on the other day without me going actively and adding new items to a website. Like, uh, okay, this is my new flag, this is my new hotel. I want everything to be automatically. And so I'm seeing a lot of projects on, on that uh, category, right, of, of, of apps. So kind of an a intelligent automation. Yeah, intelligent, exactly. And intelligence over the, the raw data that we have uh, all day on our emails, on our Twitter account. So we have uh, information uh, and data there. We just need to get the data, parse the data, and, and, and work with it. There are also some companies uh, working with data and trying to make bi the business of data. So there are companies where you can even try to sell your data. Because right now, even you are, you are doing that and you don't know, right? You're getting free services. Um, in, in exchange of your data, but you are not really aware of that. I mean, typical user is not aware of why, I don't know, Gmail is free, or why uh, another service is free. Well, maybe because there is an interchange of something there, but um, there is now uh, some kind of uh, an idea of that data, that giving that data a real value, and that value, and, and we will be in charge of that data. Just for giving an example. There are, there are some companies working on this idea. Let's say on, you are using a game, right, on, on your mobile phone, and somehow you gave permission to that game to access data of, from you. And that game has decided somehow uh, that you are left-handed, okay? Because of how you are using the phone, probably. So that app can share that data with your permission to a cloud Right, and then you install another game, and the other game can get that data from you, and now that the other game now is optimized for you because you are left-handed. So that kind of things are really interesting, and I think that will change the, the future of apps. That's really interesting. Thank you very much for talking with me today. You're welcome.